Hello everybody. In the fourth lesson for this week, we shall be looking at nature and environment and the rise of certain attitudes to the environment which inform the English Romantics 1798 to 1832. Let us open with a slide from a poet who is not often read within our canonical uh, assessments of English literature from this period, John Clare's poem, I Am. I long for scenes where man hath never trod, a place where woman never smiled or wept, there to abide with my creator, God, and sleep as I in childhood sweetly slept, untroubling and untroubled where I lie, the grass below, above the vaulted sky. Seems like an odd poem or odd excerpt from a poet to use as an opening to the talk on nature and the environment. But pay attention to what that poem is doing. No man has ever trod, no woman has ever slept, wept, smiled, walked. No humans basically have ever been there. In such a place, I would rather lie with the grass below and above the sky. For critics like Bridget Keegan, these lines embody a great romantic fantasy, access to a world without humans a pristine natural world devoid of human contamination and therefore divine. Claire wishes to exist there as he does in all landscapes he loved and wrote about, untroubling and untroubled, a nature liberated from the destructiveness of human intervention, agricultural or aesthetic. We have already in a preceding lesson spoken about the binary between nature and culture and this particular poem and I would urge you to return to that slide untroubling and untroubled where I lie. It is the clear embodiment of that binary. Nature as pure, uncontaminated, pristine, clean, almost divine as opposed to uh, the human. The romantic response to nature is not merely self-indulgent. These writers do offer a vision of humankind living in peaceful coexistence with the natural world. This view has been echoed in our own times as well and p critics like Jonathan Bate, uh, the well-known ecological critic, has argued that much of Wordsworth's environmental imagination can be seen as inaugurating a history of environmentalism manifest in 20th century writings as well. Lawrence Buell likewise with Jonathan Bate also attributes much of the environmentalist thought and environmentalist philosophies to this particular period. The Romantics believed in the fusion of the, of the soul with nature and of course the fusion of the soul of nature with the sensitive and passionate individual that is the poet. So Wordsworth's prelude, Wordsworth's prelude contains notions of the love of nature leading to the love of humankind. For Wordsworth, uh, the verses that uh, celebrate the intrinsic value of the human mind also celebrate the intrinsic value of nature. Natural scenes are rendered differently, loved due to acts of imagination in Wordsworth. However, feminist readings point out that nature is coded as female and as an object while the observer poet is the male subject. As Anne Mellor has famously described it in Romanticism and Gender, the often described exploration of nature found in canonical romantic poetry often masks a sexual politics. And some of you, if you look at a poem like Nothing, um, you will see this very clearly, where Wordsworth's boy uh, engages in an act of wanton destruction in nature. He, he breaks the branches of a tree uh, with his axe and then the poem concludes what's what says the boy's sister will have to go into the forest because she's the one who will treat the trees with tenderness almost as though there is a necessity of a gendered equivalence between nature and woman and that as ecofeminists would tell you is a classic binary the male masculine control over nature and woman where the concerns with nature are basically that of the woman so romantic concerns with landscape nature and appreciation are organized around particular lines. One, there was an environmentalist approach to the land. This is included in the wish for a land devoid of humanity which we saw in Claire's poem. Two, there is an aesthetics of landscape appreciation and we will have something to say when we look at uh, theories of the sublime and the picturesque in, the, in a later uh, session. So there is an aesthetics of landscape appreciation which has a political theme hidden in it as well because as people like John Barrell have noted, landscape appreciations comes come naturally to certain classes of people. That is, the ability to admire a land's beauty, its picturesque appeal, belongs to a certain class of people, usually landowners. So there is an implicit and very often an explicit link between aesthetic appreciations of the land and land ownership. 
Now, this is what you can think of as a political reading of the aesthetics of nature in Wordsworth's generation. So, for instance, in Wordsworth, it was important to see how people emerge from and are tied into the natural world. Finally, we need to be alert to the fact that questions of aesthetics in these texts are often at the cost of asking larger social questions of land ownership. Many of their concerns come about, about the land, about environment, come from European thought. For example, Rousseau, who evoked environmental catastrophe, and here it is Rousseau's quote up on your slide. I quote, as men consume enormous quantities of wood and plants for fire and other uses, it follows that the layer of vegetative earth in an inhabited country must always diminish. Note what he's saying. This is Rousseau who's predicting the use of fossil fuels leading to a barrenness. And look at what he's saying. It will become like the terrain of Arabia and like so many other provinces in the east because only salt and sand are now found. The development of technology, notes Rousseau, in the long run will threaten the very existence of humankind. Rousseau's The Discourse on the Origin of Inequality foreshadows many of the essential ideas of modern environmentalism. The English Romantics believed that to be situated in nature was not just the question of location. It meant to be able to absorb right with one's soul the animate being of nature. That is, you can't just be located in nature as a particular body somewhere there you need to be able to imbibe within it. And we will see some of this in um, Wordsworth's poems, where for instance, in the Tintin Abbey poem, he will say, it is because of the world around me, nature around me, that I am what I am. I have imbibed it into my soul, and that has created the consciousness that is part of what I am. In other words, my consciousness comes from nature itself. So there is a very strong theme, nature and imagination being interlinked. This is traditionally called an organismic view, as opposed to the mechanistic view of the preceding era of the Enlightenment. When, for instance, Shelley's speaker in his famous Ode to the West Wind would say, he's a leaf and a cloud, he's not drawing parallels between the poet and nature. He's telling us that the poet is nature. Who he is as a poet is because of a consciousness, of a sensibility, that is acquired from nature itself. So Wordsworth, Shelley and the others, as critics have argued, transplant nature from something external into a landscape of the mind. In Coleridge's famous conversation poems, the Aeolian harp, reflections on having left a place of retirement, this lime tree bow my prison and several others, Coleridge reinforces the idea of the receptive poetic mind. Now please recall what we have said from the preface to the lyrical ballads. A poet is a man speaking to men, but is also the poet that is imbued with a greater sensibility. He is the one who is able to absorb the things from around him. So for many writers such as Coleridge and Wordsworth, the poetic mind has a greater receptivity to nature. Magnuson, Paul Magnuson, the critic, uh, has this to say about Coleridge. Here it is coming up on slide 3. This is Coleridge's The Aeolian Harp and The Nightingale. And look at what Coleridge is doing. And what if all of animated nature be but organic harps diversely framed, that tremble into thought as over them sweeps plastic and vast, one intellectual breeze, at once the soul of each and God of all? Read that again. What if all of animated nature, and animated nature is a nature which has life animated, are organic harps diversely framed, that tremble into thought, as o'er them sweeps plastic and vast, one intellectual breeze, at once the soul of each and God of all, Coleridge in the Aeolian harp. And in the Nightingale, he would extend this argument. Earth and sky which, with one sensation, and those wakeful birds have all burst forth in choral minstrelsy, as if some hidden gale had swept at once a hundred airy harps. Occasionally, however, this link between mind and nature is broken, as happens in Coleridge's Dejection and Ode, where Coleridge would say, in this particular poem, Coleridge bones the fact that he is no longer able to take inspiration from nature. And the fact that he is unable to gain this inspiration, assimilate nature, also means his poetic output has dried up. And this is what he has to say. O lady, we receive but what we give, and in our life alone does nature live. Ours is a wedding garment, ours a shroud, 
and what would we ought behold of higher worth than that inanimate cold world allowed to the poor loveless ever anxious crowd ah from the soul itself must issue forth a light a glory a fair luminous cloud enveloping the earth and from the soul itself must there be sent a sweet and potent voice of its own birth of all sweet sounds the life and element what's he doing here look at what he's saying we cannot expect nature to be providing us all of this it is my soul which must generate it from within the soul must issue forth as he says a light a glory a luminous cloud enveloping the earth so when there is no external source of nature providing inspiration when there's no external source of poetic sensibility then you have to turn inwards which is the point he's making so the failure to assimilate is not the failure of nature it's an inner failure it's a failure as lucy nevelin points out in her reading of dejection and ode it's a failure of the mind the soul the consciousness of the poet this therefore explores the break of the link between nature and the poetic mind man and nature are linked as we have been saying several times now but sometimes nature does not work for us extending this argument is the problem that sometimes nature is defiled by humans nature is often a teacher what's what spots of time uh, in the prelude has several images about the stolen eggs the stolen boat where he will talk about it uh, those who violate nature will have to be penalized the ancient mariner is a case in point so it is not just the link between nature and humans where nature inspires sometimes humans damage that link by violating nature itself for people like wordsworth and coleridge the problem was that the countryside nature was a pastoral ideal of course but it was increasingly an untenable ideal because of what humans were doing to it and therefore people like wordsworth constantly mourned the disappearance of the countryside and they said this was due to the greed of the um human race uh, the rampant march of civilization most of the poets saw the city london primarily as having abandoned the organic link itself and you will see the image of the city as corrupt in blake's london and william uh, wordsworth's upon westminster bridge where if you recall how the poem ends wordsworth will say everything is nice and quiet and then he says this great city whose heart is lying still i'm quoting from the poem where he says the great heart that is london's heart is lying still now it's possible that he's speaking about a city which is asleep because the poem as i recall it is situated in the morning hours of the day he's speaking about the great heart of london and he's speaking about commercial london lying still but i sometimes wonder whether the word lying is not a subliminal pun as several critics have pointed out words with is full of subliminal puns jeffrey hartman's work on words what will direct you to this and is he saying that even when it is asleep london is lying as in speaking falsehoods is he referring to therefore the corruption in london's heart which is at work even when it's asleep so is the great heart of london lying still actually telling us as a kind of moral allegory that the city is so corrupt even when asleep it is full of falsehoods and lies so the link between nature and the, and, and and humanity is an organic one and for the english poets they draw their inspiration from this particular link sometimes however the link fails as you can see in the case of dejection and ode and at that point uh coleridge would say we cannot hope from outward forms to win the fountain the passion and the life whose fountains are within and that's actually from uh, dejection and ode we cannot hope from outward forms to win the passion and the life whose fountains are within he says what does he mean he says if the link between humans and nature has been destroyed then maybe we are responsible for it but it also means that we have the duty to envelop the earth and i'm quoting again from dejection and ode with the light that comes from the soul so there is a clear binary nature and culture nature is pristine pure and contaminated culture is artifice and corrupt upon westminster bridge and blake's london are two poems that talk about the corruption of nature there is a fantasy of a nature untouched which is how we began john clare's i am so this is the background to our understanding of nature and the environment we will have reasons to return to it or as we discuss various poets thank you